Good day. We've got Kirsten Brewer, president of Hydrograph, joining us today. And she's here to give us an update on the company and discuss the focus of Hydrograph's application development efforts. Please remember, this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. Kirsten, thanks for joining us. Hydrograph's had a very busy year, and now that your production technology is largely de-risked and locked down, the company is focused on application development for end-user demand. Can you please let us know how that's going? Yes, and thanks for having me on, Martin. So we are focused on two main areas, the first being lubricants and greases, and the second on composites. We've been pretty vocal about our performance within lubricants. We can decrease the coefficient of friction by 70%. And really, while this may be a less sexy application area, the, um, the broadness of this are, you know, it's huge. So we can really decrease um, carbon emissions. And of course, if we can have our machines running more efficiently, this is helping with heat dissipation and really saving a lot of energy overall. So just the, the area that Hydrograph would be playing in is about $3 billion, and that would be at a 1% market penetration. So we've had a very good result so far. And this is mostly due because um, Hydrograph produces a very unique graphene type. And this proprietary graphene that we produce works much better in lubricants, for example, than other graphenes. And remember, all graphenes work slightly different from each other. So this is something that's quite unique to the company and something that we're very excited to continue the development of. The other area would be within composites and then a niche within that would be EMI. So electromagnetic interference. These are electromagnetic waves that disrupt electronics. So whether it's in a car, whether it's in a plane or military equipment, these electronic pieces are very sensitive to these waves. So what we do is we produce a conductive coating around that, and that creates an interference so the waves don't penetrate that uh, shielding enclosure. So this is very critical to a lot of our new electronics um, you know, that impact our daily lives. This makes radar work better, our GPS on our car. These are the you know, technologies that you know, really impact our daily lives. So because we have a high conductivity graphene, it works very well for EMI shielding. And this is something that of course um, we will be upscaling. For most of these applications, you need about 20 to 40 decibels. With carbon fiber, we're hitting about 80 and the military requires between 100 and 120. So we have lots of ideas for how we can further increase this decibel rating. And this is something that we are focused on within Q1. There's a lot you you said mm -hmm. that you're you're working on here. I want to just mm -hmm. step it back a little bit, just uh, to so uh, people appreciate with graphene. Graphene is carbon, but what's uh, special about carbon is that they're I think it's what the term is allotrope, where they're different forms of carbon. Like a diamond is carbon, and so is graphene, and so is basically coal. But it's the structure of how the atoms are arranged which gives it the the, the special property. So there's nothing special about carbon. When you produce it, the 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 structure of your carbon carbon atoms is what makes yours and sort of each lit type of graphene different from one another. And then it also then what's different about it gives it certain properties that are better for certain applications and and that that's how you're essentially approaching it, right? Exactly. And so um, to expand on that, because I think that's an excellent point and a great question. Um, our graphene is very, very different from other graphenes. And this is due to the explosion production method that we have. So to kind of walk through the different points in which we're different, most graphenes, uh, we say the lateral particle size, so this is the main part of the graphene, is more micron in scale. Ours is very nano. So our lateral particle size is 20 to 50 nanometers. And what this means if we relate it to applications is we are very specific. So we can go into, um, for example, coatings and membranes really need that degree of specificity because we want only certain molecules to pass whatever barrier we're creating. So are, are what you're saying is the width of it, because graphene inherently is super thin, mm -hmm. um, but the consistency of the width or of the size of the particles is very consistent. You don't have some really small ones and some bigger ones, and then they average whatever size you, you're just a high proportion are the size you want. Is that essentially what you're saying? Exactly. And if we can imagine... Um the way materials are constructed. If we look very, very close, there's often gaps or voids. There are um, you know, imperfections that happen in processing because we are so nano in scale. 
our graphene really finds its way between these molecules, creating strong bonds. So this is either benefiting mechanical strength by making things stronger, or like I mentioned with membranes, we can create that specificity. So only certain molecules, ones that are kind of programmed in to pass or not pass can do so because of the width, as you said. Gotcha. All right. And then if you can increase EMI uh, shielding that like there's the, the aerospace world is growing huge with all the satellites and spaceships going up in space and they need the highest levels of EMI shielding, I believe. And then if there are cheaper and better ways to do it for consumer electronics, that is uh, clearly a, a huge market you're you're going after. Exactly. So with EMI shielding, electromagnetic waves, you can shield either with the um, electric side, what we are doing, or the magnetic side. So if you block one, you effectively block that electromagnetic wave. So for us, we have a very high conductivity. And if you think of graphene at the, the layer size, it is basically transparent. So we can create very, very thin um, materials that can shield these waves. Really what this is doing is, of course, it is blocking that interference and then we can have our electronics function better. So this would be not only with uh, conductivity, but we would be then leveraging the mechanical strength from our, again, the lateral particle size and just the strength of our graphene is going to assist in making these coatings as thin as possible for these highly sensitive applications. So with our graphene, we are also more, um, we have a higher purity than other graphene types. So we are producing 99.8% purity graphene with these uh, detonations. That's what we get in that one step. And we are really a market leader for bulk graphene production with our purity. So with this purity brings with it all of the other benefits that we are talking about. So when we functionalize our graphene um, to be put in these end uses, we have that, you know, the connectivity and the purity is going hand in hand. And then of course, with the um, thinness and low layer size of our graphene, we can get these properties that we're looking for. You also mentioned you've got the conductive resin. So they're actually very similar. So what we're doing okay. with EMI is we are making a conductive uh, enclosure, that shielding enclosure, and that is going to end up repelling these waves that we don't want to interfere with the electronics within. Um, with conductive resins, these can be used in lots of different applications. Um, some resins end up, so resins are normally non-conductive, they're normally insulators, and we can make them conductive by adding our highly conductive graphene. So what happens when uh, resins are exposed to heat or different um, environmental stresses is they can fracture. If we put in something that's conductive, it can usually withstand that stress a lot better than when it's an insulator. So we can... Um, basically make uh, the performance much higher in certain situations that would be more difficult. So whether these are for electronic components where things are getting hot or for other sensitive applications like within aerospace, we can create these, these tough components. Interesting. All right. And, and you you started off, and I, I would guess the lubricants and grease market is the biggest because it's a, a gigantic global uh, market. You mentioned energy savings if you're reducing lube. Um, the, the friction coefficient, but I guess I would think as well, one of the, the uh, huge values for it, if there's less wear and tear on any moving parts because of lower friction coefficient, then there's less wear and tear on the parts and they last longer, they need fewer maintenance. Uh, is that part of the, the value proposition that these new lubricants would provide? Exactly. So I would say the two largest areas that graphene can play in it, just in terms of absolute market size, would be concrete and then lubricants. We do find that uh, lubricants is a bit more interesting for our graphene type due to the performance that we can achieve, but also just due to the benefits that are possible there. And of course, this is a massive, massive industry if you're, especially if you're uh, combining lubricants and greases. So this can touch, you know, all parts of our lives from, you know, industrial greases and lubricants to, you know, what goes in your vehicle. Um, so if we are hitting, as mentioned, that 1% market penetration, the hydrograph potential here is worth more than 3 billion. So we are, we're um, decreasing the friction, we're increasing heat dissipation, and once you combine all of these effects, you know, you have a massive potential carbon savings. You have 
machines working better or parts working better, more efficiently. And then you also have that carbon reduction by increasing the life cycle of that lubricant or grease, which can be very, very significant. What we've shown with our internal tests is that we can increase the life of the lubricant by 24 times. And we do actually believe we can go far beyond that. It's just that we have had to um, restructure our research designs to incorporate that length of time. So that's what we're looking into now. If lubricants in general would be have their lives extended by 24 times, that would be uh, fairly disruptive to the uh, lubricant industry, I, I believe. And a lot of big petrochemical companies wouldn't be so so happy about that. But that's... Uh... <laughs> we have had that comment before. And just um, to specify there, that was within base oils that can be um, correlated to some degree to lubricants, but we need to generate the data for each lubricant or... Um, specific application to really show what the benefit would be. Um, and who knows what uh, the market reaction will be to that. I suspect um, these are huge companies. And I think that initially there could be some pushback if we're extending a life of a product that they don't want to quickly um, or that they would prefer to quickly replace. But I think once um, the word really does reach, you know, our audience here, um, it will be something that companies will have to do. And we yeah. see these with a lot of the green initiatives, including concrete, you know, concrete companies didn't really want to change. And we see a huge, huge push, um, especially within Europe, within the Middle East, to have these more carbon neutral technologies. What other, like, I, I think it's a little overhyped sometimes where graphene is called like the super material that's going to change everything. But uh, th there, there's definitely some truth to that. And, and you, you've targeted at several very large industries. Are there any other areas that uh, you're investigating right now as well? Yes. So we have had some good results within energy storage, um, which is interesting because this was not um, a big focus early on, but we've had third parties do some work. Um, one of those was the University of Washington, and they were looking at us as a cathode material for lithium air batteries. Lithium air batteries are one of the newer battery types and very promising, but they still have a ways to go to reach commercialization. So because of some of those results and our results within lead acid batteries, where we increase the charge acceptance by 47%, and this, of course, we have PR on, um, we are now looking into lithium ion, and that would be within the cathode. And this is work that'll be ongoing within Q1, and we hope to uh, announce soon. So you're working on that. And then in the near term, we're going to hear the, the research results, how effective it, it was on that. Okay. Yes, exactly. All right. So something to look forward to. Well, uh, your, your scientists seem to be uh, quite busy there. Yes. <laughs> Kirsten, thank you very much for joining us and uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, 2024 brings for Hydrograph and the world of graphene. Thank you very much. Likewise, thank you.